Uh, our first uh, keynote keynote speaker is uh, Will Stefan. Uh, we're really happy that you are here with us today. Uh, and uh, Will Stefan, uh, he is a world leading earth system scientist. Uh, he is a councillor at the, the publicity funded Climate Council of Australia uh, and emeritus professor at the Australian National University. Uh, a senior fellow at Stockholm uh, Resilience Centre and a member of the Anthropocene Working Group. <laughs> and uh, his re research interests span a broad range within uh, Earth system science with an emphasis on sustainability and climate change. And he will talk about the consequences of business as usual. Uh, it is a big honor to have you here with us. Uh, welcome and uh, the stage is yours. Thanks so much, uh, so much Rosemary, and thanks, Kibet, for the very nice introduction to this. So over the next 10 minutes, I'm going to give a short PowerPoint presentation of where we're headed with business as usual. So I'll start sharing my screen now, and uh, so you should be able to see my screen, and I'll get the PowerPoint going. So what I'm basically going to say is why we, in fact, are in a climate emergency, why students around the world in Sweden, in Africa, in Australia, in Europe, in America are right. First thing we can look at is what's happening to the global average temperature, which is a good indicator for the climate system as a whole. So this is probably fairly well-known data. We've had a measurement since 1880, but you can see that really since the middle of the 20th century, temperature has really gone up to record high levels and the rate at which temperature is rising itself is increasing. So in other words, climate change is actually getting worse uh, year by year, decade by decade. And we know the reason why this is happening. Uh, by far, the, the, the most important driver of climate change is our emission of greenhouse gases. And that's why important that everywhere from universities to businesses to transport, we get emissions down. So here's uh, the, the global emissions of carbon dioxide in billions of tons from 1850. And we've marked on here all the different uh, meetings and agreements we've had. But the problem is you see here from IPCC, Kyoto, Paris, sixth assessment, we've really had no impact yet on this trajectory of carbon dioxide. So this is our big challenge. We have to bend this curve, slow it and bend it and get it down very, very fast. Here in Australia, we can see what business as usual looks like. These are all photographs from the last 12 months here in Australia, where we had massive fires. This one down here is my home city of Canberra being threatened by huge fires uh, coming in uh, from the south. Unfortunately, we had uh, tens of thousands of koalas burnt to death uh, and dying from heat exhaustion. Overall, three billion animals were killed in the fires in Australia. Half of the Great Barrier Reef, the largest marine um, ecosystem on the planet is now dead. All of these are because of climate change. So it's here now and we can see what it's doing. What are our projections for the future? So this is really what you need to understand. Where are we going? So here we are, you can see 2020 down here. And there are many different pathways that we could go. The Paris agreements are the green pathway for 1.5 and the yellow pathway for two. And that means we have to get emissions certainly going down very strongly in only one decade. So that means we are indeed in a climate emergency. The promises countries have made give us this blue curve here. That's 2.7 to 3.1. And that's already a very, very damaging, dangerous climate to live in. But business as usual, if we don't meet our policies, is this gray wedge could be up to four degrees by 2100. So the problem is this is where we need to be. This is where we're promising to go. And this is where we're going in a nutshell. So our real challenge is to get us, first of all, to live up to our pledges and then strengthen our pledges so we actually get here. What's the uh, danger if we continue on business as usual? I think the biggest danger is these so-called tipping points in the climate system. Uh, there are parts of the climate system like the big ice sheets uh, in Greenland and West Antarctica, the Arctic sea ice and the permafrost, uh, but also the Amazon forest and the large uh, northern forests in Canada and Siberia. These are various parts of the Earth system that when they get uh, uh, pushed by too much climate change, they themselves change without further uh, human interference. So we get carbon coming out of rainforest, out of permafrost, out of boreal forest. 
we get increases in sea level rise uh, from uh, ice loss from West Antarctic and Greenland and so on. But the big problem is these arrows show, these can link up like a row of dominoes. And once we start tipping one or two or three, uh, we can get more and more tipped. So the, um, the, 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 real, the real danger here is these damaging tipping cascades. We think they can occur. And if a global tipping point cannot be ruled out, then this is an existential threat to civilization. No amount of economic cost benefit analysis is going to help us. And the problem is once we start this tipping cascade, it could be irreversible. So this little stability landscape, as we call it, shows you how the earth has already been pushed out of the Holocene and out of the glacial interglacial cycling of the last 400,000 years or so. So this is where we sit today, 1.1 degree. We're in a hotter conditions when we've been uh, for hundreds of thousands of years. And now we face this fork in the road. So by 2030, in just 10 years, depending on what we do, we could go toward this planetary threshold. This is the tipping cascade that could take us over the threshold and down, in, down into hothouse Earth. But if we get our act together, meet the Paris Climate Agreement targets, we could move toward what's called Earth system stewardship and onto what's called stabilized Earth. So this is the real challenge this, that we face. This is why all of us from students to, to my generation, everything in between, we actually have to now put climate change as the number one issue that we have to tackle. So what do we actually need to do practically? I like to boil it down to basically just a few things, a few targets. One is 2020, this is where we sit today. We can have no new fossil fuel developments of any kind. That is no new coal, no new oil or no new gas. We must go to renewables straight away. And that's a big challenge, maybe not so much for countries like Sweden or Denmark or European countries. It's very big challenge for us in Australia because we have a lot of coal and gas and for the major fossil fuel countries. We need to have a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. We can do this if we get to 100% renewable and become more efficient uh, in, in the ways that Quebec was talking about and Rose Marie was talking about. Then we need to hit net zero by 2040. A lot of countries are saying 2050, but that's too late. We need to focus on getting our emissions out of our economies by 2040. So this is a very simple framework that we can all adopt no matter where we are in the world to get our emissions down. What does this look like in terms of emission curve? Well, here are three different possibilities and we start from 2020. If we would have get, got emissions down from 2016, we could decarbonize by 2045. But here's the curve I'm talking about from 2020, this yellow curve, 50% reduction by 2030 and decarbonization by 2040. But here's the thing we need to focus on. If we delay only five years, only to 2025, we have to decarbonize in 10 years only by 2035, and that's not possible. So this is why it's absolutely critical now that we need to turn these curves down. So again, 50% by 2030, net zero by 2040. This is the climate emergency that we're at today is that we have to bend this curve from now, not from 2023 or 2024, 2025 now. COVID has helped us a little bit by getting some emissions down in 2020, but we have to build on that. We have to build on that straight away. So I'll close by making a connection between um, Sweden and our Australian students. So these are Australian students who are uh, demonstrating last year in front of Parliament House in Canberra. Uh, and of course they're relating uh, the English word cabinet, which refers to our government body of the prime minister and his ministers with another word for cabinet, which you can buy at the IKEA shop uh, in Canberra, Sydney, Melbourne, and so on. But the last thing I wanna leave you with is this little sign here that this student is, is, is holding, system change, not climate change. So really what we need to do is to look at a whole of system approach uh, to getting carbon out of our economy. So that's basically in a nutshell, what we're facing, uh, uh, what we need to do to get climate under control, why we have an emergency and why we cannot go uh, with the business as usual into the future. So thanks very much. Just let me leave you with this message that we are now today at the fork in the road we have to take the right decisions, make the right um, uh, decisions uh, now. So that's why it's really important that all of us from my generation uh, through to your generation and everything in between, we've got to act now 
uh, to, to solve this climate crisis. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, that's a, a quick tour of climate change. Uh, and uh, I look forward to um, hearing more about your, your efforts to get it under control. Thanks very much for inviting me. Thank you so much, Will, for shedding light on this critical topic. Uh, my name is uh, Victor Ramos, and I'm a board member of Climate Students Movement, and I'm from Stockholm, Sweden here. And I'll be leading a short uh, Q&A session with uh, Will. And so for all the viewers, please uh, write in your questions for Will in the chat, and I'll uh, read them out for, for him. So we gather them that way. Okay, so starting out, uh, Will, I have a question for you right away. Uh, so why do industrial countries seem to not care about climate change in the sense? Do we need to keep the temperature? Um, uh, oh, sorry, I, I read, it, read uh, too fast into the, the second question here. But so, so this, yeah. this issue of um, uh, industrial countries not perhaps pulling their weight in that sense. Yeah, look, I think Australia is a good example, but it could refer to China, uh, America, uh, Russia, countries like that. The problem is the fossil fuel in these industries are very powerful politically. So even after these massive fires in Australia, all the polls, all the citizen actions, all the student strikes are saying, stop the fossil fuel industry here. What does our government do? We want to build a new coal fired power plant, massively increase the gas industry. That's because they are under the control of those vested interests. So we've got to break, we've got to politically break the power of the fossil fuel industry. And that's why we need everyone working against them uh, to, to change government's policies right around the world. Speaking of government policies there, uh, how would you say, uh, from your point of view, the trend um, among COVID-19 recovery plans are looking? Uh, from a climate equity perspective or uh, from, your, from your side of Yeah, not, not, not very promising. There are a few good ones out there. Um, I think the UK is pretty good. Europe and the Green New Deal is good. Um, we're not very good at all. Uh, the US, who knows what's going to happen to the US because they've got an election coming up. I mean, China has made some uh, promises like um, peaking their emissions before 2030 and be hitting net zero by 2060. That's more than they promised before, but it's, it's way too late uh, to really meet this climate emergency we're talking about. So we need to sort of um, you know, say, thanks China, that's a good first step, but you gotta move much faster than that. So in general, no, we're, we're not there with the, with the post COVID plans of most countries. Mm, yeah, we have a question here from, uh, from the chat. Uh, I think it's more of clarification from the, from the yeah. different slides there. Because uh, of course it's a uh, compressed and, and we have a lot of information all at once here. But in the slides we have see, uh, we saw the um, different trajectories and we had the blue one. Um, yes. And so, so the question is in the slide with the trajectories is the blue one uh, representing the scenario if we stop emissions uh, we are currently uh, emitting, and the gray ones if we keep increasing the emissions. So. The yeah, rate yes. of, uh, of increase. Yeah, so, that's right. So, so, so basically, the, um, the, red, the, the green ones, and I think it was the yellow one at the bottom, are the two Paris targets, 1.5 and 2, with the, um, I think the green one was 1.5. And then we had those ones in the middle that give you about um, 2.7 to 3. That's what, what countries have promised coming out of the Paris Agreement. So the pledges that countries have made are not consistent with the Paris targets. And then the, there's a one a little bit above it, about three, that, those are the current policies. So basically go governments have made pledges which are not adequate. Then they have policies which are not adequate to meet their own pledges. And then if they just go business as usual and don't even meet their policies, you go into that big gray one. So th this is giving you the best to the worst case, depending on what countries pledge, will they meet their pledge, what policies do they put in place, and will the policies work? So th that gives you that whole spectrum of possible futures from the best case to the worst case. So our challenge is to really hold governments to account, to put in policies that are consistent with those lower trajectories, and keep pushing them to make sure they actually enact those policies and, and meet those targets. Yes. 
And now, uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of questions here, but unfortunately, we are on a bit of a tight schedule. Right, so, right, right. Um, so please uh, save your questions, everyone, and, and perhaps you will have uh, time to to ask them if, uh, will in a, a later uh, time. And now, um, we, Lucy will uh, uh, give us the introduction of our next speakers.